being uh, placed in the in the in the units, and uh, I think he's having fun taking care of the ICU patients personally. But uh, so I would like to uh, introduce Dan Yoon. Dan is at my old stomping ground at uh, Temple. He's a uh, he's a Temple grad uh, as well. And uh, he is a uh, professor of urology, uh, chief of robotic uh, surgery. He is uh, uh, he's uh, Manny Men in uh, Acolyte, uh, Henry uh, Ford uh, trained, and uh, he's brought uh, uh, Temple to the to the to the forefront of uh, of surgery and robotic surgery. And uh, uh, then uh, maybe you could uh, tell us, you know, the Alex has been wanting to say. Uh, career path and uh and mentorship and how you got to where you are but also tell them what kind of sweet setup you have uh with uh the two ors and the big uh, uh glass in between and uh and uh how that helps you with your surgeries and uh, uh and the like so thank you dan thanks for being here you're welcome thanks steve well, I'll actually include, I've included that some of some of my slides since I knew that I was speaking to primarily a resident audience, but good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome um, to the talk from uh, my living room in Philadelphia. Um, I, um, I'm gonna talk to you guys uh, this morning about uh, upper track urinary uh, uh, track reconstruction. You know, I'm not gonna include, um, you know, lower urinary tract things like bladder diverticulectomy, and bladder neck uh, type of reconstructive work, but I'll, I'll focus primarily on upper tract uh, robotic reconstruction. All right. Um, all right, so here are my disclosures. Uh, I have financial relationships with Intuitive Surgical. I do a fair amount of teaching activities for them. Um, I also consultant for Johnson & Johnson, and then I help find um, found a company called the Melzi Corporation, which is uh, a new device company. <clears throat> so this is one of my favorite uh, pictures uh, depicting what uh, a French comic um, from 1914 uh, showed how the artist envisioned the operating room of 2000. It's really a neat picture if you stare at it and look at some of the details because you know, the operating operator is um, using hand controls, feet controls. It's uh, mechanically connected to the patient and they're doing some type of intra-abdominal procedure. I guess they're envisioning what modern day anesthesia would look like as well. Uh, and if you really look and see what this artist has envisioned, it's in concept in many ways very similar to what we are doing today, just a little bit simplistic. And so as Steve said, I, I did my, um, amazing training at Henry Ford Hospital uh, in the early 2000s. And uh, I was very fortunate to be, you know, right at the right place at the right time uh, when robotics uh, was starting off, uh, getting off the ground. And you get to see some of the pictures uh, and how robotics had progressed even during the short time that I was there, how uh, we conceptualized uh, an operating room that was built around the robot. And you could see these are th large 3D screens that were built into the walls. Uh, back then, and you can note the first generation Da Vinci standard that we were using at that time. Uh, in 2008, I graduated from Henry Ford Hospital and I moved uh, to my first job <coughs> at the University of Pennsylvania. And the, um, you know, the, the attitudes were a little bit different from uh, where I came from and where I was going to. The, uh, you know, Dr. Menon's, uh, you know, visionary concept was trying to apply robotics to, uh, you know, anything that potentially could uh, be useful for uh, robotics. And so it, in, it included much more than just prostates, but trying to understand how to do kidney surgery and adrenal surgery and then ureteral surgery and uh, trying to encompass all of urology. You know, um, it was very good that I went to a place where, you know, I was told to, um, you know, manage the expectations and to be careful about what uh, we say that we can do. And I think that this was a very good uh, uh, mindset for me to uh, then uh, take things in a stepwise approach and to tackle things one step at a time and to then uh, study and report on what we were doing. Um, so as you guys know, we do a lot of things uh, with the robot now oncologically. Uh, 
This is an example of a five renal mass partial nephrectomy that we did. Um, this is a 640 gram simple prostatectomy specimen. This actually was taken uh, as a resident uh, when I was at Henry Ford Hospital. Uh, 500 gram radical prostatectomy I did, I think um, about a year and a half ago at Temple. And um, as, sorry, I'm having some trouble here moving my slides around. So, um, you know, during the years where I, I moved on from uh, the University of Pennsylvania to Temple at uh, around 2012, you know, I have been able to do all sorts of different types of procedures. And you can see kind of from this, uh, this listing that uh, essentially this is a list of open operative urology. There's many, many things in here that I've been able to do. And I kind of look at the robot in many ways, kind of like a uh, Swiss army knife to be able to tackle all sorts of urologic problems. And so one thing I was able to do when I moved to Temple was to build a robotic teaching suite. It's a one of a kind uh, operating room environment where um, I typically will, will operate and, and, and sit in uh, the command control suite all day. Uh, the two uh, consoles in the middle uh, are mine and I go back and forth between OR5, which uh, houses the SI, and OR6 that houses the XI. <coughs> um, my fellow will run one of the rooms and divvy it up with one of the chiefs on service uh, that will run the other room. And typically we'll do four or five, uh, maybe six uh, cases out of there in a day. Uh, and the rooms are built in with uh, microphone and speakered in as well as videoed in with 2D and 3D. And what this really has allowed me to do um, is to uh, capture safety because you know we all know that that's the most important thing. One thing I didn't like was to leave physically one room and turn my back on a patient, which I don't have to do anymore. Um, I know that what's going on in, in both rooms at all times. Uh, I also have a very efficient setup so that I can still punch out many cases in a day. And uh, the, really the area that I uh, am most satisfied about is being able to maximize teaching opportunities. You know, instead of racing through the room uh, with one case to get over to the other room, I can sit back and allow residents and fellows to do a little bit more. And, uh, uh, you know, starting from last year, we've been able to have steady conversations with all of our patients about having overlapping surgery. And I've had actually very few patients that have had a problem with this. Um, so with, as far as pushing boundaries and doing um, things outside of my comfort zone, you know, a few thoughts on that. You, you know, you have to have a, first a foundation of excellent training. Uh, you have to along the way be also be very honest with yourself and with your patient and tell them, look, I've only done you know, I've never done this type of case or I've only done a couple of these cases. And, um, um, you know, if uh, there's any kind of problem, this is our plan B, plan C. Uh, you, um, you have to be able to take criticism because some of the things that you may do may be controversial. And certainly I've uh, run into my fair share of criticisms along the way. Um, you, you also have an obligation if you're gonna do something new to, to publish and present. And so, uh, I think that at Temple, I've been uh, able to uh, take large strides with being able to put together a research team and be able to share this and join many consortiums as well. Um, uh, how that's changed my practice, uh, you know, when I first started out my practice, I would say about 5% of what I was doing was benign uh, reconstructive surgery, namely pyeloplasty. And, and um, uh, uh, in 10 years later, um, 12 years later, approximately 40, approaching almost 50% of my volume is now benign, uh, non-oncologic uh, reconstructive surgery, uh, which encompasses not only upper urinary tract reconstruction, but also simple prostatectomies, bladder diverticulectomies, and all sorts of you know, unique and strange problems that may be encountered along the way that are referred to me. Uh, and I really do think that you know, doing bread and butter is not really the future role of tertiary care centers but to be able to support uh, the surrounding community practices to be able to do kind of the difficult and esoteric things. So uh, going on to upper urinary tract reconstruction, um, the traditionally, you know, this has been done through an open approach 
Uh, and over the years, uh, myself as well as you know a bunch of colleagues uh, in the robotic world have really kind of ventured into this territory and found a lot of great interest in this, but also found great success in being able to do upper urinary tract reconstruction. Now, <coughs> when we talk about ureteral strictures, there's limited traditional um, approaches here. Um, for uh, ureteral strictures, you could start off with endoscopic management, but we know that uh, the uh, failure rate and required retreatment rates are high. Um, you know, when you come to mid and distal ureteral strictures, you know, you have a little bit more options because the bladder itself is relatively mobile. And so that uh, you can uh, do a ureteral reimplant, but uh, you can adjust to uh, add a psoas hitch and extend further with a Borari flap. Uh, but when you get to the upper half of the ureter, you start running out of options. Um, you know, uh, in the beginning, before we really started developing some of our technique, techniques, excuse me, um, we, um, uh, I used to do more ureter ureterostomies, which are just primary repairs of the ureter. And, uh, you know, the, the, the a primary problem with doing ureter ureterostomies uh, is that um, you have to fully dissect out that the regional ureter, um, which then you devascularize. Uh, you may have to cut out some of the segment, and then you have to um, bring the edges together. Um, and when it's fibrotic, you have to end up um, mobilizing more ureter, devascularizing further, and then pulling it together on tension, thereby decreasing the blood supply to the critical ends that you're anastomosing. And so it becomes, uh, you know, a, um, a bigger problem. And then um, if a, a stricture recurs in that area, then you really have a problem. And so, you know, I feel that um, ureteral ureterostomies are okay for uh, short segment strictures that have minimal amount of fibrosis, but, you know, you can't just look at the length itself, but you have to look at the quality of the tissue that you're dealing with. Um, and, uh, you know, historically, we've written about appendix uh, being used as a, um, as a medium to uh, to repair, help repair the ureters, but you know, across the board, it's really not been utilized well. And I'll show you how we've been uh, uh, reapplying that uh, with robotic surgery. But for for anything that's more than a short favorable stricture in the upper half of the ureter, you very quickly traditionally have to go to a ileal ureter autotransplant or just a nephrectomy, or tell the patient you have to live out your life with hardware inside you. <clears throat> so some of the new uh, and modern concept in, uh, in upper urinary tract reconstruction, I'll share with you three. Uh, robotic access. So, you know, I, I hesitated to say something like this early on uh, in my career. I think about 12 years in now, um, and, and now that uh, I've really kind of understood um, and had experience with what I'm doing, I would tell you that uh, complex anatomy and reoperative fields are not necessarily contraindications. You have to be very careful with your own experience and your capabilities. Um, but, uh, you know, these days we don't shy away from prior x laps, colostomies, gunshots, uh, redo, redo, redo surgeries. We pretty much approach all of them as robotic and we find that very, very rarely do we have to turn back and not complete the procedure or have to convert to open or refer to, you know, one of my, my colleagues, open colleagues. <clears throat> the second statement I'll say here is that use of infrared um, fluorescence imaging, which we'll talk about a little bit more here afterwards, uh, is really critical in helping uh, to accomplish these tasks uh, when it comes to upper tract reconstruction. Uh, you know, trying to identify the unidentifiable, things that are completely socked in and fused in, um, you know, you need help. Um, to be able to see perfusion of the tissues and to be able to make intraoperative decisions. You know, we've never had this type of information available to us before uh, on the field. And I think that, that you have to use this to leverage, um, you know, an advantage, uh, especially when you're going minimally invasively and you don't have tactile feel. Uh, lastly, uh, bulky mucosographed urinoplasties, appendiceal interposition onlay, bypass, and I'll explain what some of these stuff uh, that I'm talking about uh, uh, later on by video, side to side reimplants. These are kind of, you know, old principles uh, that, that can be um, 
reinvented and applied uh, using new revised applications. So as the um, robotic platform has changed over the years, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that my uh, reconstructive um, uh, volume has gone up and really our capabilities have, have gone way up with increased uh, uh, and uh, improved tooling of the robot. Uh, it's just a better instrument. Uh, it's able to uh, roam through greater areas of the abdomen. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, a slide that I, I've uh, borrowed from uh, the talk that we give at the AUA on robotic upper tract reconstruction, really showing what we're able to do with the robot. Um, and the upper third, mid third, and lower uh, third ureter with adjunct procedures off to the right side column. And so uh, downward nephropexies, buccal mucosa, omentum, you know, many times we, we combine some of these procedures, uh, adjunct procedures together to be able to finish the task. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, with this type of advanced and complicated procedures, you know, we need to be able to understand perfusion. We need to specifically identify structures and locations in the ureter. Uh, and uh, this is just a, a basic diagram of how near infrared works for those of you who are, are not familiar. Uh, we uh, can use an injectable agent called endocyanine green. Um, and uh, uh, with laser light uh, or uh, the light source that uh, we uh, can apply from the camera, it excites uh, the signal that comes uh, from um, the ICG and it will fluoresce. And so the, the uh, easiest and basic, most basic way to describe its uh, primary use is uh, vascular perfusion. And so this is a, 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 um, a female patient that had cervical cancer treatment, high dose radiation. And here we're reimplanting the left ureter back onto the bladder, but this is onto a radiated field. So you can see that uh, the ICG shows uh, where it's cold is where the radiation damage has happened, the fibrotic changes in the distal ureter. And so uh, very simply, we're able to see devitalized ureter and just cut it off and then reimplant a healthier ureter uh, back to the bladder. So additional examples, this is a cystectomy. Uh, and so here the ureters have been disconnected. You can see this is a left ureter. On the spatulation, just on the left side, that needs to be trimmed a little bit. You can see that it's a little bit cold. But look at this, under white light, it looked completely normal, the uh, right ureter. But you can see a good four or five centimeters of distal ureter is completely de devitalized without any blood supply. So here, we're gonna chomp off a good segment of it to get down to healthier tissue, and then we're gonna reassess that. So the way you would do that is typically two cc's. If you have a very large patient, we may sometimes use three cc's. A, little old lady, sometimes of 1.5 uh, um, cc's of uh, intravenous ICG will ask anesthesia, will time it properly, and about 45 seconds later, or once you turn on your infrared uh, mode, <coughs> you'll be able to see uh, uh, vascular perfusion. Um, this is a, a, a case where there was a double level stricture, uh, proximally and distally, the decision was made uh, to do a right side ileal ureter. So that you can see this is our, our ileal ureter segment. Um, and you can see that I, I felt like I stretched it more than I needed to. And so um, what I did was um, I injected ICG just to see what the perfusion was. That's the renal pelvis to the right. And you can see my anastomotic line. You can see the ileum lighting up really well, but it's really the anastomotic ends. Here's uh, uh, where I reimplanted onto the bladder dome. And you can see that, uh, that this gives me peace of mind to know while I'm in the operating room that I have good perfusion to my, both of my anastomotic ends, and I feel better about that. Um, last uh, example um, is uh, looking at uh, perfusion here. So this is a ureter enteric stricture that I revised. I cut out uh, the strictured end. Above on the screen is uh, where um, the ileum, uh, the, the, um, the ileal loop is, in, and here's my anastomosis. What, um, what you're able to see here is that when we, when we gave the ICG intravenously, you can see the anastomosis here. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor. Um, this is the area of interest and I wanna make sure that it's really well perfused. And you can see that bright signal that I'm getting there tells me that we have really good 
uh, perfusion at the anastomosis. Um, so um, all the video examples I just showed you were quick fire uh, video examples of intravenous ICG usage. And I'll go on to talk about uh, off-label usage of intraurethral ICG. Um, and all my slides will be um, labeled uh, as it being off-label. Uh, but this really came with, um, with this growing demand for, um, to do more and more complicated ureteral reconstructive cases. And sometimes just finding the ureter in itself was very difficult. And so, um, you know, uh, I started uh, asking my patients if uh, they would be okay uh, with using this in an off-label fashion. Uh, we did have an IRB study to uh, look at this and we started injecting it directly luminally um, into the ureter. And so uh, it'll really help in, in times where there's fibrosed ureter, um, avulsed transected ureters where the ureters are, you know, a mile apart from each other and we have to go hunt for both ends to try to put it back together. Ectopic location of ureters, supernumerary ureters. And, and really the colorectal and GYN uh, colleagues have really taken this concept that we first published on and now they are uh, applying it in the ureter on robotics cases simply to just have early identification of the ureter as to not uh, injure them. And sometimes we'll use it for that case for, for that type of uh, <coughs> situation as well. And so here uh, we reported on it, but you can see in this picture here on the right side, this is a pyeloplasty that we um, were doing. And you could see that under white light, everything looks normal. But uh, when we uh, flick on the near infrared, you can see uh, the, the whole urinary tract lights up. And so um, typically on, on these type of very difficult type of cases, you know, if we can't find the ureter, we'll inject uh, ICG intraurethrally. And uh, in about five to 10 minutes later, the ureter will slowly and progressively start lighting up more and more green. And um, in some cases, it can be tremendously helpful and save a lot of time in the operating room and save a lot of anxiety uh, uh, as we can quickly find the ureter. Um, um, and so I'll show you a bunch of video examples as well, but uh, these are, there are many times where you can use this. In the beginning, we went a little bit crazy and we used it in all the cases. And uh, really we've now tempered it down to using it for the cases that we just really needed for. Um, so this is a really kind of interesting case. This is a ureteral triplication anomaly on the right side. I've only seen one like this. And, and uh, we were tasked with uh, taking out the upper uppermost moiety of uh, this kidney uh, with uh, three separate ureters. You know, here the difficulty would be to, to injure or traumatize the long ureter. And so before we even open up the retroperitoneum, you can see the ureter of interest, the one that we injected with ICG lighting up. You can see one ureter there, two ureters, and three. And they did follow Weigert-Meyer's law. So it was very interesting for us to kind of see uh, the cystoscopic view uh, retrograde. And uh, once we established that the ureter was, the lowermost ureter was going to the uppermost moiety, we injected that with ICG. And here it's like cheating, right? The, uh, the ureter of interest lights up, the other ones don't. And then we uh, take out the, uh, uh, the uh, ureter that's uh, glowing green. And it really is helpful um, in cases like this where you could end up getting confused. So it's an 80 year old patient uh, who had uh, developed a uh, ureteral uh, stricture uh, uh, distally a few years after he'd received a cystectomy. And here we're dissecting out. Um, so in these type of cases, there's always a difficult lice of adhesions to do as many of these cases do have. Once you slowly start dissecting more and more of uh, the adhesions down, things start to make sense. In the beginning, you're not really sure where everything is. And uh, here we start to realize, okay, I think here's my ileal uh, conduit. Um, this is the mesentery. All this other uh, bowel segments we can start taking down. Um, and so you start to, to get a sense of the anatomy. So here's our conduit. Here's our mesentery. We know not to mess with the mesentery and the blood supply to the conduit. And as we get down to the base of it, now we're starting to hunt for uh, you know, tubular structures that they look like a ureter. And typically as you get close to the area uh, of the uh, fibrotic segment, you'll, 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 you'll encounter it and you'll kind of, your spider sense will tell you that you're dealing with um, a fibrous ureter. So here we quickly find the right side ureter. We're not interested in the right side ureter. And so we, we keep moving on. And, and what we did was we injected the left ureter with ICG, the, the, the side of interest. And so here, 
<coughs> in the left ureter down the PCN, we put in five cc's of uh, ICG. And as we get down to uh, it, we're going to confirm it by turning on um, our near infrared. And there is it, it, it uh, fluoresces very brightly so that we can see for sure this is our left ureter before we burn any bridges. And you can see this thing kind of just tapers off and doesn't connect to the conduit. And so here, maybe IR was very aggressive in trying to balloon dilate this, but it was a completely evulse off the, um, the base of the conduit. So here we're gonna spatulate it. And here are the hard work is all done now. You know, um, the, the rest of this is, it's almost like a glorified pyloplasty. The skill set here is very easy to put it back together again. It's really the, the fight to get here and to understand the anatomy and to dig everything out and have it uh, ready for you. And so um, a few more video examples of uh, how uh, this can look intra, uh, I'm sorry, this is not, this is a little bit different. Um, I'm gonna pause this for a second. So this is a case where somebody had um, uh, a ureteral tumor that uh, we tried multiple times to treat this conservatively as endoscopic treatment. And after about the third failure, um, we decided to go back in and remove the segment and, uh, and put the ends together. Here, we're not doing intraluminal uh, ICG. This is the third example of how to use uh, near infrared. It's using white light scope. And so he, there's a ure ureter scope here. And it's important um, in this case that we uh, identify exactly the location of this, of this ureteral tumor. So under visualization, my resident's got a scope in there. And we, we, I passed the needle through into the lumen of the ureter to identify exactly above and below the ureteral tumor. So here, um, once we've tied it off, you're, you really don't want to take any more excess ureter because you want to try to keep uh, the ureter segment that we're cutting off um, as small as possible. And so here we're going to cut off um, the ends of the ureter. And plan A was to do a ureter ureterostomy, but what had ended up happening was after I removed the segment, uh, there was too much uh, tension to try to put the ureter back together again. And I didn't want to really strip out the whole ureter and compromise its blood supply. So we went to plan B, which was doing a ureter, um, appendiceal interposition. Now, this is where uh, the plan keeps going sideways. We were looking for the lumen and we realized that the, the appendix is completely obliterated through uh, maybe its uh, proximal segment. And so we decided to put the back ends together and do an augmented anastomosis. Uh, so what we're doing here is putting the back wall together. And here, this will allow for a little bit more tension because we're not pulling the whole ureter together. So I anteriorly on the ureter. And then what we're gonna do is unzip uh, the, uh, the appendix because I can't tell exactly uh, you know, where I'm gonna be able to use it if I have enough length here. So instead of uh, trying to take a chance here, we're just gonna unzip it and just do an onlay. And so by augmenting the back wall together, we're just gonna simply roll this ureter, uh, the appendix on, and uh, onlay on the anterior surface. And so you can see here's a suture line along one uh, edge of the anastomosis. Uh, and just what I'll say about this, probably the most critical, one of the critical decisions here when you do an appendix, either in a position or an onlay like this, is uh, that um, you really kind of need to position the, the uh, cecum properly for you. And so, um, uh, you know, a lot of times we'll do a cecopexy just to hold the cecum in place favorably and not to have it shift around before or after the surgery. But if you lay it in a, in a good spot where it's favorable, then it won't continue to fall in your face and it'll allow you to technically put this back together again uh, with, with uh, greater ease. Okay, so the, um, the three things that, um, that I just went through with a bunch of videos were are summar summarized here on this slide. The uh, first one is uh, the way it was initially um, meant to be used was uh, on label intravenous ICG. Um, it says IV root three cc's, but more often these days we do two cc's and uh, quickly push 10 cc saline chaser behind it. Wait about 30 to 45 seconds, and then you'll see the arterial phase and then the venous phase, and so. Often I'll use this even during um, straightforward pyeloplasty. So, um, you know, I, I challenge you guys that if you guys are doing um, a pyeloplasty, uh, the way I've uh, approached my pyeloplasties has changed, um, you know, since I've been um, thinking about using this. Um, 
you know, what I do is I do a minimal dissection of the UPJ without really dissecting it out fully. Um, I'll inject two cc's of ICG intravenously um, through my 10 cc saline chaser. And then um, when we turn on the infrared, what I'm really looking for is that early phase, that arterial phase. And what I'm looking for is where the ureteral blood, the, the UPJ, uh, the renal pelvis and ureteral blood supply, where the arteries come in. Once you can see where the arterial inflow to the region comes in, I'll base my surgical plan off of that. And so what I find myself doing lately is doing less traditional Anderson Hines dismembered pyeloplasties. And I'll uh, end up doing more uh, things like YV plasties uh, or dissecting out the, the, the back wall. Because a lot of times what I'll see is that the primary blood supply to the UBJ comes from the renal pelvis. And so what you don't want to do is completely cut across that back wall and make your proximal most ureter ischemic. I think that, that um, when we have UPJ failures, part of the reason why is that we don't understand the blood supply to the area. And although I don't have a ton of data on this yet, um, you know, I do have a, a feeling that when you preserve the blood supply coming to that proximal most ureter, we'll probably have an opportunity to decrease our, some of our complication rates and our failure rates here. Um, the second use is intraureteral um, ICG, which I showed you. You can inject it anti-grade or retrograde. This is off, uh, off label in the United States. Um, I've never had an adverse reaction to date, and I've probably used it in about 200 cases or so. And so, um, you know, I, I feel like, you know, the patient actually gets a lot less of a systemic load of the ICG because we're not injecting it intravenously. Uh, um, and, and uh, you know, in healthy ureter, it will shine through the ureter in about five, six minutes. In diseased ureter, you might have to get closer and may, maybe even break through uh, a thick uh, periureteral line before you can see uh, uh, the green. But, you know, in, in these type of cases, you know, as we start hunting for the ureter, you know, I'll continue to toggle the, eye, uh, the, the uh, near infrared on and off, on and off, on and off as I do in the dissection. And at some point, the OR will burst with cheer as we find a little gleam of green shine to bring go, ah, there it is, we found the ureter. And so um, the one thing I'll have to say is that if you do enter your ureteral ICG, um, you can't then go back and do intravenous uh, ICG because everything in the, in the ur uh, urinary system will be staying green, especially after you spill it. And so you have to kind of pick and uh, choose carefully which one you want to use as your preferred route. <clears throat> either intravenous or intraureteral. And the last way to use near infrared imaging um, is no ICG and use a scope, a And uh, uh, this will really help uh, in being able to identify precise locations, uh, for example, of the ureteral strictures. Um, sometimes we'll stick it in uh, the ileal conduit or in the rectum, um, in the colostomy to be able to find uh, which segment is what. Uh, and so it, uh, using white light in, in conjunction with near-infrared uh, mode is uh, very useful as well. And to understand all three of these uh, kind of modalities really increases your armamentarium and your options uh, and you do, when you do these type of cases. Now, this, case, this picture I put up here because this is a, um, a uh, reminder for me to say uh, that I've learned to trust the intravenous ICG signal um, over, over the years. Um, this is a Bowari flap that I was doing um, on a patient who had a, a history of cervical cancer and she had high dose radiation to her deep pelvis. And, um, you know, a lot of her, her bladder was, uh, was radiated. Um, when I ran this Bowari flap, um, um, you know, I curiously put on the uh, um, near infrared after we injected IV ICG. And, and what you see here is the tongue, you know, the Bori tongue here is completely cold. And um, I guess I didn't really know, um, you know, what to do. So I went ahead and just completed it. And wouldn't you know it, about a week later, this whole thing broke down. And it just became a, a huge mess for the patient. Uh, and she went through a very difficult, um, you know, uh, rebuilding period before we could go back. And uh, we ended up giving her an ileal conduit like two years later. Uh, but it was it was really a mess. And so uh, one is that I've learned a couple things from this. One is to trust the ICG signal um, uh, when I'm doing uh, the operation. And number two is uh, 
you know, doing a Bawari flap on a radiated bladder is really a big no-no. Um, and it's really something that I would only do in last case resort. And I would try to execute a different option if at all possible. Um, because taking a broad swath of, of, of bladder and, and, re and reconstructing that in a high dose radiation case can be very problematic. And so these days I really shy away from using a uh, Bawari flap in a radiated uh, patient. And so um, let's go on to talk about uh, buccal graft. Uh, so this was first <coughs> um, first credited to Dr. Nade uh, in South Africa, who uh, actually used a baboon live survival model, kind of showed this well-established concept that we know in urethroplast, and we've been using it, you know, for decades this way, but really wasn't applied to the ureter uh, until the late 90s when he started to do this, and he uh, did it on four patients. And uh, Lee uh, Zhao from NYU, many of you guys know who he is, um, really kind of a, um, a great partner in, um, in uh, my, amongst my colleagues uh, in ureteral reconstructive procedures, but also just a really good um, person that uh, took this concept. Uh, he, I think he uh, has a lot of provocative ideas and, and is bold enough to try, try them. And so he first tried this at NYU. And I remember uh, going to the WCE in Taipei, I think it was like 2014 or 2015, and I ran into uh, Mike Stifelman, who I knew, and, uh, you know, I asked him, is this for real, you know, or is this just BS? And he goes, no, this is real. We did this on four patients. It worked out great. And I remember flying back to Temple um, and then doing one the next week and calling him back and saying, this is really an amazing option and the, this contribution to the field, if this really works out in larger numbers is going to be great. Um, and so since then, we've been able to uh, put a lot of our patients together and uh, we've uh, uh, presented this at multiple uh, meetings as this is an emerging concept and we've written about it uh, just uh, with our own institutional series as well as a multi-institutional series and show uh, over uh, the years that this is a really a great concept. Um, and we just put in uh, the manuscript uh, for combined two greater than two year follow up for uh, our patient series with over 50 some patients um, showing approximately an 85% success rate uh, for um, buccal mucosa graft, which I think really has enhanced our ability to take care of these patients and is really an important concept in uh, upper tract reconstructive surgery. And so uh, uh, the words of wisdom about this operation, um, you know, in the beginning when I first started this off and I didn't know what I was doing, um, you know, there was a lot more stress <coughs> and um, maybe I didn't think of some of this uh, uh, properly. And so uh, these are kind of my words of wisdom. So I think one of the great benefits of doing a buccal mucosal graft ureteroplasty is uh, the minimal need for dissection. And so you really, um, uh, don't need to completely over dissect the ureter like you traditionally would uh, for a ureteral reconstructive procedure. You can typically leave the back wall down on, on uh, you know, it's usually socked in uh, to the retroperitoneum and, uh, and do a minimal, maybe an anterior dissection just to understand where the ureter path is. And you need to dissect to above the stricture around the stricture and below the stricture so you can see kind of where it's stricturing and you can use ICG or ureteroscope to help you to sort that out. And then um, uh, once you do that, then you do a longitudinal ureterotomy, um, opening this uh, with a pair of sharp scissors. And um, uh, typically I, I, I open the ureter anteriorly and then um, uh, um, put my buccal mucosa uh, down anteriorly and not dorsally. Um, I know that I get a lot of these questions, do you do it um, ventrally or dorsally, kind of thinking about the penile urethra and really um, anteriorly because you have a line of sight, um, you know, on the robot to be able to sew the graft down anteriorly. It's much harder to do it posteriorly. And uh, I would only advise to do it posteriorly if you don't have any momentum to use. Say the patient has a completely burnt up um, momentum and you have no usable way to bring blood supply to it. Then, uh, you know, I think Lee <coughs> Zhao has done one posteriorly and he's advised to, to not do any more that way unless you absolutely have to, where they would open up the, the, um, the psoas fascia so that you're staring at the individual belly uh, of the uh, psoas musculature 
and sew your graph down to it posteriorly. It's a lot harder to do it that way because everything is now following in your view. So um, it's, it keeps it a lot simpler if you just open it up anteriorly and then lay it down, um, your graph down um, anterior medially. And so um, the one lesson I learned was uh, to not to oversize it. You know, I always felt in the beginning uh, nervous about these things. And so I would make it maybe 20% bigger. And what I realized was that, um, that uh, it becomes floppy and uh, you know, if you inject it under retrograde, you'll see it becomes aneurysmal. And so you really wanna measure it to fit. Um, and so we typically, once we open it up um, and we uh, have determined that we've cut up high enough and low enough, we'll then bring a little ruler in and, uh, robotically and we'll measure it exactly. And then after that point, we'll then cut it out. And I don't recommend pre-cutting out buckle to try to save some, some time because you really don't know what size you're gonna need. Sometimes a three centimeter structure will turn into a four centimeter structure once you've cut you know, and you've opened it up to the way that you want to. And so um, I advise to, to measure first and then cut the graft out. Uh, and then we're very careful about uh, wrapping the momentum, uh, wrapping the graft up with the momentum and fixing it very carefully. Fixing it one, because you don't want the momentum to just tear off easily and you also don't want to bag the blood supply. And so one of the things I may sometimes do after I fix the momentum um, around the ureter um, is I'll, I may hit uh, intravenous ICG and look at it under near infrared just to see that my momentum has good blood supply feeding uh, my graft. Okay. Uh, and, you know, the one uh, thing about buccal mucosa graft ureteroplasty is I feel like it's always a freebie. You know, if your patient has this, you have one shot to do it before you, you know, um, need to go to a traditional, um, you know, big difficult procedure. And so um, when I explain it like that to the patients, they typically are very much in favor of trying to do a buccal mucosa graft ureteroplasty. So here is one of my earliest cases um, where <coughs> we had a patient who um, um, essentially was wheelchair bound already. And then as he was crossing the street, there was a big uh, 18 wheeler that turned and clipped and dragged him down the street and maybe about two blocks. Uh, he ended up having a completely avulsed ureter, required an X-lap uh, splenectomy. They just put a PCN in. And you know, he came to me about a year and a half, two years after this had all happened at his, he'd been living with uh, nephrostomy tubes. And I just knew that this was going to be just a terrible case. And this ureter was going to be completely socked in. You know, the only way, and he told me, look, if you can't put it back together, I want it removed. And so I, I realized that the ureters were going to be very far apart. Um, I was going to have one chance at doing this. And so we decided to do an augmented, um, uh, an attempt for an augmented ureteroplasty with buccal mucosa graft. And so here um, I, I pre-spatulated anteriorly knowing that that was my plan. We knew that there was going to be a large distance and even after mobilization, I felt like this thing wasn't going to come together again um, without doing something more. And so here we're going to do a downward nephropexy. So um, what I'll tell you about a downward nephropexy, you know, I've had to do more than my share, fair share of these so far in my career, um, is here we're burning the nephrostomy tube and getting rid of it, um, is that to do a proper downward nephropexy, we're truly mobilizing the entire kidney um, um, and able to move it four or five centimeters down, um, you really have to commit to it. And it takes about 45 minutes to an hour worth of work, right? To completely free it up, except that it's just on its vessels. So you hear, you know, there's a four to five centimeter downward um, mobility here. Now I know that I have one shot to be able to put this back together again. And that downward nephropexy gave me that ability. And so here we're able to put the back wall together, right? And so this is an augmented anastomosis now. Um, and so now that I have a urethral plate laid down, then we're going to take a buccal mucosa graft and onlay. And so this is one of my earliest ones. So this is probably a little bit thicker than I wanted to be. Here I'm using PDS. Normally I don't use PDS. I use monocryl. Uh, typically I use a 5.0 monocryl. Um, so the PDS gives you a little bit more memory. And so that's why I stopped using it. Uh, but this is probably around 2015 or so where I did this case. Um, and so at this point, once you uh, are at the buccal mucosa graft uh, portion of the case, again, the hard work is pretty much done. You know, all the hard work is, was to dig this thing out 
and to be able to get to the point where you can put it together. And so at this point, this is kind of like a polyplastic-like skill set, right? Typically, it won't go wider than a centimeter, centimeter, or half. You really don't need to take a wide ureteral segment. And so here, we're doing our mental fixation just to make sure that the thing is secure. And you can see a uh, renal scan at 10 weeks after hardware has been removed. She was a T1 half of nine minutes and 32% preserved renal function on that side. And so uh, a couple other concepts that I'd mentioned earlier, ureteral bypass concept. So <coughs> um, this is a procedure that we recently described. Um, this is using the appendix, but for only certain special situations. So we have to make a large jump to the bladder. It's typically in a case where the bladder has received high dose radiation. So rectal cancer, cervical cancer, where uh, the, the bladder is small capacity. So it's uh, 150 cc's, you know, 200 cc bladder, and you have a stricture uh, that's too high. And so what I don't want to do is, like I said earlier, I don't want to run a Boari flap off of something like this. And so appendix bypass, you know, it's neat is that in this type of uh, case, we're, we're not transecting the ureter because I do realize even with uh, radiated ureters, there is axial blood supply. And what I don't want to do is cut whatever remaining blood supply. You know, usually there is some kind of blood supply coming up onto the ureter segment from the internal iliacs. And so you want to leave that alone as much as possible, especially in a radiated case where the um, post manipulation um, fibrosis or changes in the ureter may be unpredictable. And so here what we'll do is just, I'll actually inject uh, IV ICG and I'll turn on my near infrared. I'll actually look for the, um, the axial blood supply arteries running up the ureter and I'll cut away from it or in between them to do my ureterotomy and uh, maybe make a one centimeter ureterotomy above the structured area and simply give um, the ureter a second route into the bladder by using appendix. And so the original UO is still connected, it, although it may be obstructed. And that way we do minimal dissection on the ureter and on the bladder to be able to put uh, the drainage back together. So this is a uh, ureteral bypass procedure and what that looks like. Let's see, looks like I have about um, five to 10 minutes here. And so I'll kind of move this along a little bit, but there's our, our eight centimeter distal stricture. Uh, this patient had, um, a colostomy, um, they had um, um, a, a very hostile abdomen. Here, we first try to put the bladder, pull the bladder up in the soma hitch, and it wasn't going to make it. It was about a six centimeter gap. And so uh, instead of trying to force it together, we're going to use uh, the appendix here. So I, you saw me do the cecal pexy here. I'm closing my cecum back up in two layers. Um, and then I'm going to address this. Uh, so here we're going to spatulate our end of our, um, our appendix and we're going to suture it. Now here I'm doing something a little bit different. I'm not, I, I actually, I'm starting my anastomosis before making my ureterotomy. And so I'm going to sew one side of the anastomosis down first and then open it up. It's a little trick uh, just to prevent um, a lot of urine on the field uh, while I'm establishing my first layer. <clears throat> and so after uh, doing the ureteral anastomosis and passing the stent through. I'll then complete my uh, other side and then dunk uh, the, the tip of the uh, appendix onto the dome of the bladder. So here I've uh, opened up the um, the muscular bladder wall without opening up into the mucosa. It's another trick I use to prevent the bladder from decompressing. Finish one half of the anastomosis, then cut the mucosa, uh, suck out all the fluid, and then um, finish my anastomosis. So here, uh, intravenous ICG is injected and just showing that we have preserved blood supply of our appendiceal interposition. It's very important here that you don't mess with the inner, inner, uh, the appendiceal artery. Uh, it's a technical point, I think, that um, that uh, the the uh, intravenous ICG can really help you visualize where that artery is. 
because we're not familiar with where that artery typically sits. And so you want to dissect out your, your appendix enough to use. You really don't want to mess with the appendiceal blood supply. So this um, is a little bit of a particular case. I got a <coughs> emergency call. Um, this is a catastrophe that we ended up um, taking care of, probably to date one of my most difficult cases, a 51-year-old morbidly obese patient who is BMI 61. Uh, she's getting hysteroscopy for dysfunctional uterine bleeding. And I guess unbeknownst to the GYN, had punctured through the uterus and biopsied uh, something that looked long and tubular and proceeded to pull out 18 centimeters of ureter and the renal pelvis as well. Um, and uh, so they placed a PCM tube and then shipped it over to our institution. Uh, and that's kind of where this story takes off. And so in the beginning, we initially managed her with percutaneous drainage till things settled down. Um, I was planning on doing an ileo ureter, and I really, you know, this is a retrograde. You can see there's no renal pelvis here. I didn't believe that in the beginning. And so I, um, I went in thinking I was going to do an ileal ureter. And then what I realized, and this is the, the area of the renal hilum, it was no usable renal pelvis that I could sew to. And so I'm humming and hawing on what to do. She really didn't want an nephrectomy, and she was a uh, diabetic. <clears throat> and so what I encountered was the world's largest appendix. So uh, very lucky for me, uh, there was a 12 centimeter, but 12 centimeter isn't an 18 centimeter segment. And so what I thought I was going to do here was I was going to do a downward nephropexy and a ureteral calicostomy to bring the kidney down and maybe gain uh, four or five, six centimeters. And then what I was going to do was do a psoas hitch and pull the bladder up. And that way I could pull the urinary tract uh, down and also up to be able to make it into a 12 centimeter segment. And so a little bit of luck uh, and uh, a little bit of good anatomy. Uh, and here we're able to do a complete uh, downward nephropexy. Here I'm putting three points of fixation on the posterior kidney and pexing it down to the psoas muscle to be able to pin the kidney down. That's step one. Uh, uh, here now we're taking the appendix being careful, very careful right in this area to not injure the uh, appendiceal artery. Um, and then at this point, what I'm planning to do is to do um, a psoas hitch here. What I ended up doing was a downward nephropexy and then doing a lower pole calicostomy. Um, to be able to take this appendix um, and, and to be able to put the urinary tract back together again. So here, the tip of our appendix. Surgery. So it looks like we have about eight minutes left. So here we're using 3-0 monocryl to reimplant um, this is our distal end. And so we, uh, we, we do, um, so there's, there's some people that, um, that may try to reverse this appendix. We feel like if you take the tip of the appendix and put it up to the renal pelvis, I feel like that that would actually, um, um, potentially twist the ureteral blood supply. And so, we actually have put in all of our appendiceal interpositions and onlay um, in a, a reverse peristaltic fashion, and we don't think that that's been a problem. So I think somewhere in the video here, I missed the, uh, the um, ureteral calicostomy. So before uh, this video ends, I'll go back to it and talk you guys through that. I think when I missed that earlier on because the video is very abbreviated. And so, um, Once I did my psoas hitch here, you know, I think I used the wrong video segment to actually not show. Oh, here it is. So here's my lower pole has been clamped, uh, the artery has been clamped off. And here, one of the important points for the residents is that if you're doing a, a ureterocalicostomy, you've got to evert the uh, collecting system edges out. And so, uh, what we did was uh, kind of a modified uh, suturing where you could see that um, 
if I bring this back out, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, the suture that I'm using is to be able to, I'm taking inside the collecting system and then um, trying to do a hemostatic uh, stitch by using a sliding clip that's in a modified fashion. But what that essentially does is stop the bleeding, but also pulls the uh, inner collecting system out to be able to sew uh, the appendix or to the ureter to it. Anyway, um, and so, sorry that, that was a little too fast here. Um, anyway, lessons learned from um, procedure development over the years, um, you know, technology and skill can provide better solutions for uh, patient problems. <clears throat> um, you know, one thing I've learned is that uh, these procedures need to be teachable and reproducible. Um, you know, what I'll show you um, in this was, uh, this is an example of something that's not really teachable and reproducible. Back in my earliest part of my career, uh, I was approached by the spine surgeons uh, when I used to work for the University of Pennsylvania to do spine inner body fusion and give them access robotically. And so here's the, you know, an example of what this procedure looked like. Um, here we're splitting the aorta and cava. That's the anterior spinal ligament. And we're gonna put drilling hardware into the inner space. We co-docked a robot and a C-arm together. And here I'm lifting up the vena cava. We've put, in cli we've put clips on the lumbar vessels uh, of the IVC and of the aorta to be able to literally split above them. And this is an L4 and L5, L5S1 double level uh, spinal fusion. You know, this terribly risky operation, you know, you can see that uh, we're essentially putting these red rubbers around the vena cava and aorta and we're gonna pull them. Um, so my assistant uh, at body side is gonna be able to pull these red rubbers and be able to part, you know, the two great vessels and so that we can put heavy drilling equipment down onto the spine. You know, as, you know, difficult and as spectacular as this type of procedure may be, what I've realized, um, you know, from doing uh, this type of work was that this was so complicated and so risky that, you know, this may be reproduced by one or two people. This is not really doable uh, and uh, not really reproducible by the, our field or by the masses. And so, um, you know, my point being here uh, that uh, if you're going to procedure develop, you know, and you and come up with something new, it's got to be something that's teachable and reproducible. Otherwise, you're going to be doing something in a vacuum that's not going to be really reproducible and you've not really contributed to the field. And so to contribute to the field, techniques need to be translatable to the greater, greater surgical community. And that way we can try to enhance our field for, uh, for many. Um, anyway, um, I, I think this concludes uh, my talk and it'll give a few minutes for you guys to be able to share some questions with me. Uh, this is uh, our fellowship that we have for one year, um, it's open for 2022 to 23. This is my fellow from this year, Zeho Lee, and all the different we were able to visit uh, over this past year. Both with this coronavirus uh, uh, business, things will soon settle down and we'll be able to uh, potentially do some more uh, travel um, in the future with our fellowship.